recording and then we're recording now. All right, we're opening the uh, bylaw subcommittee meeting at 9.02 on March 4th. 12.02. Thank you, Laura. 12.02. So um, you guys saw that I sent you sections one and two, and thank you, Michelle, for sending some comments on that. Um, trying to just get uh, my thoughts together for as we move forward, I just want to give you guys a little bit of an update on where things stand. Um, so section three, I went through yesterday with Alex Weisite from um, Copeland and Page in detail. Um, and I'm going to revise those sections and then I'll be getting that to you hopefully really soon. Um, and so that that will mean that we have basically sections one, two, and three drafted. Those will be clean documents for you guys then to do track changes on. I'm going to have a page set up on the CONCOM website um, that has the existing bylaw regulations, the um, marked up uh, the, the marked up ones that we've been working from for each section. And then um, any comments that town council has, I'll include those documents. And then um, the clean versions that have been marked up by you guys will eventually get up on there. And then what I'd like to do is for each section have a draft to basically have for um, public hearing for review of the public and comment of the public before it's reviewed by the full commission and approved by the full commission in a public hearing. That's kind of like the gen general timeline I have in mind, but if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Um, I know I'm kind of barreling through this a little <laughs> with the explanation, so. Um, when you say public hearing, Erin, you mean that uh, we'd be bringing like section by section to the full CONCOM to be talked about it? So my thoughts on that are that what we will do is have, we'll have the revised, the old version, the, the markups and the new version available for the public to review online. We will say that in the legal ad for the public hearing notice. And it will be very similar to a public hearing that we have for a project <laughs> with CONCOM, right? We'll open it up, we'll say, just general in general terms, we're revising the entire bylaw. This is where the revisions came from. We've gone through this whole um, bylaw subcommittee review process, and these are our final sections. They're available for review and comment from the public for you know a period of time. If anyone has comments, you're welcome to submit them. Say over a 30 day period, they can submit comments to us. People can comment on it in the public hearing. We'll have a public comment phase where people can talk about it, but we're not going to be going through it with a fine tooth comb like we are right now. We're not going to be going through every single change. We're going to be saying this is the revision. If there's comments on it, comments. Um, and basically, I'm hoping that there might be some minor adjustments here and there, but for the most part, it will be reviewed and approved in the public hearing as this is the vetting process right now, this is the process where we're giving, we're going through it section by section. So that's kind of what I'm thinking um, and what I talked about with Dave, but if you guys have thoughts on that, please, please share. So just to clarify, when we review with the CONCOM members, it will be in a public hearing. Yep. And if we want to present, well, I mean, I, I, I do think that a, that a public hearing is this place. And if, and if any CONCOM members have any issues with anything that they wanna you know, tease apart more section by section, we can do that. We can absolutely do that if people have questions or if the public has questions, we can tease it apart and explain the revisions and why they came about and why we made certain changes here or there. Um, we, you know, if there's a, a section that's like controversial, we can delve into that section. But my thought is to not go through every single change because, I mean, the first round prior to me even looking at it, there was over 800 changes. And since I've reviewed it, there's been a ton more. So it would almost be impossible to go through every single change. 
Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention to you guys. So my thought about today was to go through section five and section six, which is like a little paragraph, but <clears throat> section four is um, going to be very tricky. Um, there's a lot of problems with it. I'm just going to state that sort of at the get-go. Um, I, I talked to Michelle a little bit offline about this, but basically um, I, and, and I, I kind of delved into this with you guys a little bit too, but so there's basically, there's two ways that you can do it in a bylaw when you're referring back to the Wetland Protection Act regulations. You can either copy the Re Wetland Protection Act regulations and paste them into the, your bylaw so that they're basically the, saying the same exact thing, right? Or you can refer to the Wetland Protection Act directly and just say the Wetland Protection Act regulations apply under the bylaw. Or you can write your own or some combination of the two, like the Wetland Protection Act regulations apply except where explicitly stated in these sections. However, what my observation is, and I'm more than welcome to, sh I'm more than happy to share these sections with you guys if it's useful for you to see. I did a comparison of section four, the Wetland Protection Act on one panel and the bylaw regulations on the other panel. There are certain sections of the Wetland Protection Act that are taken out of the bylaw regulations, like it's copied and pasted, but then certain things are taken out of our bylaw. And then there's other places where things were added in and it's all throughout um, the entire section. And it's very confusing about what sections apply and what sections don't apply. I talked with <coughs> Alex about it, um, the town attorney, you know, there's certain things that are take provisions that are taken out, which add additional protections. Um, and also the other thing that's very bizarre, all of the inland resource areas are in there except for riverfront, which is very weird. Like why was riverfront left out? Um, so I am essentially going to rewrite those sections somehow in some capacity. And um, that one is going to be a big section to go through. Uh, very complex. Um, a complete kind of pain in the neck, to be honest with you. I don't know why they, why it was designed that way, the framework of it. Um, it may have just been the opinions of the people involved in drafting it. I really don't know, um, but it's just so you know, that's why we're skipping section four. So we're, we've gone through sections one and two and three um, in the original document. Sections four, we're gonna skip for now. <clears throat> and section five, we're gonna have a look at um, today. So we'll, we'll revisit section four. Does that sound okay? Do you guys have any questions or comments on that? I'm down with that plan. Okay. That sounds good to me and thank you for all the work. Okay. You are welcome and I'm happy to do it if it makes our lives easier, which I think in the end, this document is gonna be much easier to enforce um, and administer. There's gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have a ton of suggestions for you guys on a ton of discussion items. Um, I think we're probably gonna have to dedicate two complete sections of the review to section four. And the other thing I just wanted to mention really briefly is in two weeks, the meeting that we have, my son has a physical in the morning at 9.30. Usually they only take an hour and then I would be dropping them at school and getting back. But I just wanted to give you guys a heads up and I'll try to get you the documents in advance just in case I get held up for some reason at the doctor's and can't get back for noon. Um, it's like a big worry for me that I won't make it. Um, uh, on that note, I can't really do any earlier on a Friday, but I can move it later in the afternoon if you guys want to make it one o'clock for that meeting or whatever. I could do that if it makes everyone's life easier. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna impact anything. It's more so just my anxiety about like, oh my God, I've got a 9.30 appointment and am I gonna be back in time? Um, I think I'll be fine, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. If I'm like 10 minutes late, you guys could get started and have a look at the document. The other thing I was gonna maybe broach with you guys is to have one two hour session for section four. 
Um, like if we could have one session where we go from noon to two instead of noon to one, but you guys can think about that over the course of this session and then we can um, talk about it. I don't think this section is gonna take as long as the other sections, but I do think we should jump in if you guys are okay with that. Okay, so here we go with section five. Um, the first notation, unless otherwise specified, we're uh, here in the procedures for filing a notice of intent under the State Wetland Protection Act shall apply. Um, some wording changes here. Um, nothing earth shattering. I did have a look at several other towns and their bylaw fees just to get a sense of our fee schedule here to see if we are in line, if we need to update anything as far as um, the fees that we're charging people. Our fees are pretty are pretty um, on the same line as a lot of other towns in the area. So I don't really think that we should change a whole lot. Um, there is one change though that I would like to discuss with you guys, which is the fee for the emergency certification. Um, I personally would like to remove the fee for emergency certifications because usually when emergencies happen, it's a threat to public health or safety. It's something that somebody's got to deal with whether they want to deal with it or not. And um, if they don't deal with it, then it means that there's a safety issue or a health issue for everybody involved. And having a fee associated with it just makes it a real administrative pain in the neck because um, somebody contacts me usually around 24 hours in advance and says, you know, um, this emergency has occurred. I have, a, I have a huge tree that's hanging over my house about to, you know, break my roof. Can I, can I cut it down? And then I've got to be like, well, you need to submit a $75 check and you've got to submit X, Y, and Z. And, and then after the fact, I'm hunting them down for the money and um, after the work is already done. And I just think that it, it is a, um, it dissuades people from dealing with emergencies. And, you know, if people don't deal with emergencies to threaten public, you know, public health and safety, then it ends up being, um, you know, it's, it's not good for anyone. I would rather make it easy for them to deal with an emergency. Um, and we have them a lot. So just kind of getting your thoughts. I mean, <laughs> other towns like Northampton charge $100 for an emergency. Um, I do have a thought on that. Um, okay. Lori, do you want to, do you have anything? Um, how to put this, uh, Morally speaking, I'm 100% down with that thought. So I, I would like to see that happen. Somehow we get the emergency cert to zero. That said, uh, you might have partially answered my question already. My concern was going to be how much does the town actually get from this? Where will it hurt the budget? Does it hurt conservation budgets, et cetera? Uh, you're telling me it happens a lot. So we probably rely on some portion of this money. Uh, but yeah, as far as the ideal, uh, I'm with you 100%. No one ever asked for emergency cert. Just a little tiny personal story. I know we're short on time, but I used to own a small tree company, and that was always my deal. If you called in with a hazardous condition, we'd make it free or as close to free as we could because you didn't ask for it to happen, and they're expensive to remove, and that's all there is to it. So I definitely like the idea. I would just want to make sure that we are not angering our own budget. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that was sort of along the lines of my thought too, is I assume these fees are covering some administrative cost burden. So if they are frequent and um, are a significant part of revenue for covering the administrative part of this, then that's a, something I'd wanna consider before removing it. But I totally agree with like the incentive of people addressing it without a barrier. Um, I don't know if this is an option that would work, but we could increase. Well, another thought I had was 
how long have the other fees or all of these fees been in place? Like, are they something we should be revisiting with like inflation and just the true cost of doing business at this point? Um, are, are they old rates and should they be revisited? And if we remove the emergency cert, do we want to increase them to sort of cover some of the costs associated with that lost revenue? Yeah, so all excellent questions and comments. Um, emergency certifications usually come in the form of a phone call or an email. And I always like if let's say I get a phone call from somebody that says I have an emergency, um, I will tell them you have to submit in, uh, something in writing to me, either just a, a hard copy letter that you submit to the office or an email that outlines who, what, where, when, and why that it's an emergency, all the details. Um, and I go out, do a site visit just to visually confirm what they're telling me is the truth. And then I have a two page form, very simple that I fill out sign, scan to them so that they have 30 days to um, do the work to um, take care of that. From an administrative standpoint, it's not any more um, involved than a certificate of compliance, really. Um, it's the same exact process. I get the request, I go out, do a site visit, and then, you know, um, we, we also do handle ratifications of emergency service in a meeting. So I'll say there was an emergency. This is what the situation was. The permit needs to be ratified. And that's basically that. Very low impact from an administrative um, standpoint. <clears throat> All of our fees go into the general fund. They don't go directly to the conservation department. So they go directly to the general fund of the town and they don't go to anything specific to conservation is my understanding. Um, so it's not going to change the conservation budget based on those funds coming in. So that's that's one thing I wanted to mention. And then the other thing is, I'm going to be completely honest with you, I haven't been collecting them. I haven't been collecting the fees for, for them because I don't think it's right that we collect a fee for it. And so I just don't even bring it up. I just say, submit your request and I'll process it. Whether that's okay or not okay, I don't know, but I'm just being honest. Um, I don't really agree with it. I don't think... Um, if somebody has a tree that's hanging over a public way that could, you know, kill somebody, <laughs> I don't think that they should have to pay a $75 fee to when they're already paying $1,200, $2,000 to take the tree down. I don't think they should have to pay an additional fee. Um, so anyway, hope that answers your questions. But I don't, well, I don't. It, I mean, a site visit is a significant expense, just, you know, in a cost of doing business way, but I guess the fact that it's all going into a general fund, I'm not sure how to like think about these fees in general now. So that seems seems like they shouldn't, they should be going towards support of your work, but I don't know. <clears throat> is there any precedent or a mechanism for, this is just spitballing here, but um, to keep an emergency cert fee, but charge it to the person doing the work, Again, just speaking from experience, I'm a tree company and I'm gonna get $2,400 to take this tree down. I don't mind making it $2,475. You know what I mean? If the filing goes to the, I, I don't know if that's even legally possible. Mm. I mean, usually it's the landowner that has to pay the application fee or the applicant. Um, I mean, the other thing is we could make it really a low fee, like 10 or $15, you know, so that it's like, sort of negligible and not so I guess no I mean if this is going into the general fund it's not actually supporting your position or any of the work that you're doing right so then what are the points of these fees um if they're not directly going to cover the administration expenses of of doing them well I mean there is a budget line item for my position so um you know the town pays me from their the annual town budget so it just provides a little bit of like income to compensate for the fact that there's staff um the general fund can go into salary money i mean i assumed it goes into whatever <laughs> that's a good question i'm not a finance person so i can't answer that um but i <laughs> but i can tell you like just as an example for like an an anrad filing like abbreviated notice of resource area delineation where the entire site is being delineated and I'm walking every inch of the site 
those fees can be in the thousands and usually they are like the application fee will be like $2,500. Um, and if we get a couple of those, we're, we've got like five grand, you know, in application fees just from two over the course of the year. That's just an example. Then there's also notices of intent. Those are also significant application fees, usually in the realm of anywhere from, um, I mean, it, it depends on what the activity is, but they can be up to a couple thousand dollars as well for the permit filing. We also don't have to make a decision on this right now. You guys can think about this. If yeah, you I mean, I sort of think we might want to consider upping. Okay, so there's a disconnect between the money, the significance of how much we're charging and what the money goes to support. So I don't even know how to answer this question because what's the, I mean, if the general fund is going to like go to something totally random, like what does this even reflect, these costs even reflect? So I have a hard time with this. I, I Maybe Dave could weigh in on this, but emergency cert is pretty high compared to the rest of them. So if we could tack on like $10 to adjust for like, you know, the inflation of the times, the other ones and lower the emergency cert, maybe that gets the cert, you know, touches the surface of this, but yeah, without understanding more about the intent, like who, the purpose of how these dollar amounts and what the funding goes for, I don't even know how to answer it. But I agree with bringing the incentive of people addressing emergencies without penalty. I mean, I totally agree with that. Okay. Well, um, let's move on uh, so that we can try to get through the rest of the section, but um, that it's all good questions and good um you know, to make wise decisions about how we do it. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm kind of, he I always hesitate to raise fees because I, especially now with inflation, it's like, it's so expensive to, you know, buy groceries for your family or whatever. So it's like, I don't want to raise, you know, fees for people to file permits if we don't have to. And I don't really see that we have to, but um, I, I understand and I agree that, um, you know, at the end of the day, I've, I'm here and I'm, you know, somehow the town has to budget for my position and, you know, justify that in some way. So, okay. Um, all right. So plan requirements for a request for determination. This is, this, these whole, this whole section is very confusing as far as, um, it goes back and forth a lot between requests for determination and um, notices of intent. There's way more permits than that, as you can see, I mean, from the permit list, there's, there's a lot more than just requests for determination and notice of intent. Um, there's ANRAD, there's amendments, there's extensions, there's certificates, there's emergencies, there's enforcement orders. Um, there's all kinds of permits that we issue. So. Um, I just changed this to wetlands bylaw, but you'll see as we go through this that there's like a back and forth about RDA versus NOI and the and the plan requirements. So I just want to preface with that. So this says plan requirements for filing a request for determination. Um, so the whole point of a request for determination is for you guys to make a decision, number one, approving the delineation, um, looking at the area and whether it's jurisdictional to you, or permitting work and making a determination as to whether or not that work is gonna have an impact on the resource area. This is saying that you can use the town of Amherst GIS mapping to depict the wetland resource areas for your application. Now, in some very, very limited cases, that might be okay, all right? Um, and I, I have in like maybe two instances since I've been agent or since I've been administrator for the commit commission have allowed that. And those are in situations where people are really far away. They're putting in like a fence or doing something that would ordinarily be a minor activity under the Wetland Protection Act. But generally speaking, this is something that, that the state does not allow. Like you cannot use just a wetland layer that doesn't confirm anything in the field 
for a permit filing. Um, so I wanted to highlight that because it's confusing to the public and they see this and they think, oh, I can just print out the GIS layer and that tells me where the wetlands are. And that's not true. You can print it out and it says there's no wetlands and the whole site is covered in wetlands. And or you can print it out and it says there's wetlands and you get out there and there's nothing. Um, so they're really, the, the wetlands layers in GIS are not reliable. They require a field um, confirmation. And so I'd like to adjust this so that it's straightforward and not misleading to people. Can we just remove that entirely, Aaron? You said you've only used it twice. Yeah, <clears throat> why yeah. not just remove it? It's yeah. Trouble. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure why this has a preamble. Preambles are for the um, resource area section, so it doesn't really belong there. Um, there's a lot of things here, like the statement with due regard, like weird language that um, I don't, it's, it's just unnecessary altogether. So I highlighted those things. I'm gonna go through here and rewrite this section, but I'm just trying to highlight for you the things that are like, okay, this is weird and I'm gonna change this. Um, once again, <laughs> there's a reference here, um, you know, it's referencing, so as part of any wetland application, you have to include a USGS, uh, the most current USGS topographic map has to be included with the application. And this is saying, um, in the case where the project requires two or more plans to show the locus, which is the locus map, um, eight and a half by 11 sheet, clearly identifying the proposed work with labeled boundaries of the resource areas must be submitted. So I don't know if this is supposed to be a separate like number, like D rather than included with C, but it gives the, the impression to whomever's reading this that you can, you can use the USGS map as the plans that you submit for your proposal, which you also cannot do. Um, it's mostly just to show where the site is located for our reference point, and also to make sure that there's nothing on the site like a perennial stream, because the USGS will tell you whether the stream is perennial or intermittent. So I just highlighted that, and I'd like to um, make that clear in revisions. Does it possibly mean like a zoomed out version on a single sheet instead of... Um... So in saying where there, you need like two, two sheets to show the whole thing, is it saying um, to also submit like a single, you know, zoomed out version so the whole thing is visible on one sheet? Is that what it's saying? Maybe. Because <laughs> that would be helpful. I don't know. If I don't know if you need a rule, but. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It's not clear to me. So uh, the proposed work labeled boundaries resource areas must be submitted. I mean, I just don't even understand why it's, it, um, yeah. Let me, let me work on wordsmithing that a little bit. And when we, when we come back with the revisions, you guys can have a look at it and see if you think it's you know, if we can improve that a little bit to make it a little more clear. Um, so this is repeated again and again throughout the application. It says um, local tax list. It's another very confusing thing because Pete, because you can actually go on to the town's GIS website or map site and do a buffer that tells you where abutters are within 300 feet. The problem is that is not a certified abutters list. And the problem with that also is that the GIS data is only periodically updated with ownership information. So for example, let's say Michelle is doing a project at her house and her neighbor next door just sold to a new person and, and moved away three months before. 
and Michelle goes in and she uses the UI, the um, town of Amherst um, GIS mapping software to produce her tax list. And she's notifying somebody who already moved away three months ago versus if she went to the, to get a certified abutters list, the assessor's office would, would have an updated record of who the new owner is, and then it would go to the correct person. This is something that the state requires. It's got to be a certified abutters list. I don't know why local tax list is even stated here. It should just say certified abutters list. And this, this issue comes up again and again um, in these regulations. It's referred to as a local tax list as opposed to a certified abutters list, which is always the language that is used in the Wetland Protection Act and any other towns um, bylaws is how that's referenced. Hmm. <laughs> um, So these, these sections were wiped out and these were not by me, these edits, these were by others, but um, I think that the calculation or that the um, edits that were made are, are fine. I think it's kind of like just some of, some of the requirements in here are overkill and also duplicative. Like if you're in a flood zone, if you're proposing work in a flood zone, you have to do compensatory storage period. That's a requirement under state law. So we don't really need to get into all of this um, complex soil analysis information. Um, they have- to Can you just scroll up so I can see the header? <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Just, okay. Sorry, go on. I just wanted the full picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, I mean, we've we've talked about this before. This is for a notice of intent, it could be a single family house. Single family properties are not subject to stormwater calculations under state law. Um, I did insert um, in another section some requirements that if the commission in its discretion decides that there needs to be a stormwater management plan on a given site, due to site specific conditions that the commission has the discretion to require that. Um, but I don't think we re should require it for everyone because like if somebody's putting up a fence, if somebody's um, putting in a garden, if somebody's putting in a pool, they shouldn't have to hire an engineer to do stormwater calculations. It's just way over. But what if they are putting in a house? I mean, shouldn't they have to do a perk test? Or does that well, they come have along to, later? They, they have to do a perk test anyways with the Board of Health. Um, we, don't, we don't evaluate a perk test. We don't approve a perk test for a septic system. That is done completely through the Board of Health. So it doesn't belong in these regulations. So let's say you buy a property and you want to see if you can put in a septic system to build a house. You schedule a perk test, you file a permit with the Board of Health, the Board of Health agent is out there with you and witnesses the perk test and signs off on the perk test. If you're putting in the septic system, you file with the Conservation Commission and you have to show where that plan is located, but I'm not looking at your perk test results on that. That's a Board of Health sign off. <clears throat> It's a jurisdiction issue. Um, is F the same as C kind of? The stabilization of, I mean, is that why that got crossed out? I mean, the new C, F and G were uh, redundant. So I didn't, I didn't actually make these edits. These were done by others, um, but I, don't disagree with these. Um, you're not gonna produce, okay, so let's just take these one by one. Description of any alteration of the flood storage capacity of the site. You're not gonna be evaluating the flood storage capacity of the site if it's not located in a designated FEMA 100 year flood zone, period. So it, it's, it's, and that is covered in bordering land subject to flooding, which is in the performance standards for the resource area specific section. It doesn't make sense for that to be included here. Soil characteristics um, in representative portions of the site. Any application includes 
soil information. That's a sort of a standard um, requirement of a notice of intent application through the state. Runoff and plan calculations using TR5 modified soil complex method and based on 10, 50 year, 100 year flood frequency. Those are stormwater calculations that are done for multifamily subdivisions. Um, they're also required for um, industrial, for commercial work. These are not single uh, requirement of single family. And also those are state those are all state requirements. Those are all state laws, the stormwater management. So having that duplicated in here doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because it's a requirement of, under the state. We, the town has a stormwater management bylaw, which is administered through the Department of Public Works. That's a whole separate um, regulation that they administer. We have the stormwater, we have stormwater regulations which are tied into the Wetland Protection Act through the state. I don't think it makes sense for us to restate things in the bylaw that are already required under state filings. Um, I think it makes things very confusing and it doesn't specify here anything about these calculations not being required for single family homes. I do think that F is actually not a bad one to keep. Um, I do agree that um, slopes facing wetlands are important to stabilize and maintain. So um, I am not opposed to putting that back in. Yeah, I mean, that was the one that I was wondering about, but I also didn't know if it was uh, redundant with the next one. No, I don't think that it's redundant because no, I don't think it's redundant because they're two, two separate things. I think that's fine. All right, plan requirements. Um, <clears throat> so this is saying that any plan requirements submitted to the to the Conservation Commission, whether it's just a bylaw requirement or a state requirement would require one inch equals 40 feet scale on a plan. The state minimum allows one inch to 50 feet. Again, it's like, you know, we're telling people if you file it, like the sta state standard is different in Amherst and they have to basically revise all their plans to comply with the, with the town bylaw. And I just don't think that's necessary. Plans are completely readable at a one inch to 50 scale. Um, I don't really see why they would need to be one inch to 40. I can agree with that. It makes it easier for everybody if they only have to print one set cheaper. Right. Yeah. Okay, so here I inserted this competent professional here because this is a, um, and you guys may have seen in the document that I revised, I added competent professional to the definitions list. This is a huge one that's so important. And the state does not have a definition for competent professional. And this can really create a lot of problems because you get somebody who, let's say they were a, they worked as an excavator for 30 years and they come and they decide that they're gonna start a wetland consulting business but they have no experience in soils. They have no experience in plant identification, biology. Um, it's just really important that people have experience and that they're competent to be submitting stuff to us. And if we have no requirement, <laughs> anybody could do it. I agree. And I liked your definition that you put forth in number two or something. Can I just throw something out there for the previous thing you said? Yeah. With the, the, um, the scale. So I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I just had a thought about why that would be different if there was intent to that or not. But we do have like some subtle differences in the bylaws about um, like vernal pools or maybe um, potential vernal pools or resources that might occur on smaller scales than like a large wet meadow or something. So the only reason I could see 
that being useful for us is if under the bylaws, we sometimes look at smaller um, resource areas that are like, you know, a, a bordering wetland vegetation could be 10 feet. Um, and would that detail be lost at a larger scale, like for the purpose of reviewing Does that make sense what I'm saying? Like sometimes yeah. we are taking a finer scale look at things than the state does and yeah, okay, that. Do you think in a case where there is like a 10 foot you know, riparian edge, like, does that disappear on a one by 50 or like, is it just depicted, but much so, smaller? You know, Michelle, I think you do, I think you do make a good point um, that there are, and I don't even think we should specify one inch, it, based on the comment you're making, I don't think we should specify one inch to one inch to 40 feet. I think that what we should say is the commission may require at its discretion that plans be drawn at an appropriate scale on a case by case basis that differs from the state standard or something to that effect because like you said you know it for example if it's a really really small site they may need to zoom in even further um, generally speaking we get plans at multiple scales usually we'll get like one plan that shows the entire site on one scale and that might be one inch to 200 and then and then we'll it'll move into like other sheets and then the the additional sheets will zoom in to you'll see like they'll be match they'll be matched across the entire site and i can show you an example of this if it would be helpful um i mean i can i can picture it it just seems like they probably have to do that for their own for their own purposes, you don't you don't need to go in. I don't want to hold this up too much. <laughs> I, I like your no, no. compromise. No, I think I you do like where you're going with the wording, Aaron. On a, yeah, the, at our discretion and keeping the scale open ended. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if you get a plan and you can't read it, you know, you can say, um, "We want this at a different scale." This is just an example from Hickory Ridge, and I was just looking at this one the other day. Um, so this is like a um, over a site overall schematic that shows the entire the entire site, right? Um, stop, stop, stop. Computers keeps going. Anyway, um, you can see it's trying to, yeah, see. So and then each of these squares represents a smaller scale plan that zooms into these areas. And then so if I keep scrolling through the plan set, it's going to zoom into drawing C2 and E1 and then C4 and E3 um, to those specific sections of the property so that you can see them at a more refined scale. Um, so anyway, let's just say. Yeah, maybe so like you suggested removing that one by 40 and then just the yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, Something like that. Uh, commission may require at its discretion that plans be drawn at a scale appropriate to see site conditions on a case by case basis. So if we get a plan and we can't really read it, we can say you need to submit this at a better scale. Does that sound good? Okay. I'll wordsmith this a little bit. I'm going to go through the whole section and rewrite it just like I did with the other sections, but I'll. <laughs> I didn't like this permanent and seasonal. Um, even if it's a seasonal wetland, it's it's permanent. It's there year round. So I don't really like that language. Um, oh, <laughs> 
I actually wanted to insert something on this particular one. There are occasions where we get from very specific consultants, um, they will delineate a wetland and then they'll put a little arrow pointing to it that says low quality wetland. And I would like to put something in the regulations that states no personal opinions can be stated about the quality of a wetland um, because it's, it's almost like how do I say this? It's almost like propaganda. When people see that, they immediately say, oh, it's a low quality wetland, so it's really not important. And to me, there might be marginal wetlands or wetlands that have been impacted so much by human activity and development surrounding it that it's, you know, it's there, but it's not connected to anything because all of its hydrologic connection has been disconnected. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's not functioning. It doesn't mean that it's not high quality. Um, and, and that it's serving some kind of natural resource function. So that was just an idea that I inserted there because I do think that people shouldn't be stating their opinions about the quality or lack thereof of a wetland. Yeah, and, and if they mean maybe that like um, it's highly invaded or degraded, as you said, it's still not really relevant to the bylaw. What it, a wetland is a wetland, right? Yeah, exactly. And there and and it doesn't really matter. They're all regulated the same. So even if it is a highly degraded wetland, it's still equal. It has equal protection under the law. Um, so I don't really see that there's any that that's productive to state that. Um, I just change this to resource areas or buffer zones so that it's just clear that all all impacts have to be have to be accounted for. Um, this color coding thing is ridiculous. Um, it's not necessary to require a color coding system for consultants. If we can't read the plans, we spit them back and say, resubmit the plans. They're unreadable. I've done that a hundred times. Um, this is a really, really important one, um, requiring the, the commission can require a surveyor to do this. We have so many sites in town where there people try to use a GPS unit and there is no way that they are getting submeter accuracy on wetland flags, which, you know, submeter accuracy is less than three feet um, accuracy. And if you're depending on a plan for um, design and construction purposes, if it's a heavily forested site, in my opinion, the commission should be requiring survey um, and not depending on submeter GPS. Um, just my personal opinion. I agree. I mean, I've been out in the field with submeter GPS and especially in forested areas that can, or, you know, cloud cover. Yeah. With, yeah. yeah. And they're not required to say to us, oh, this point here is like only accurate to 20 feet. You know, it could be 20 feet this way. It could be 20 feet that way. <laughs> you know, um, if it's a survey, we know where the point is. And I think that's really important. So this is getting back to the drawings and the requirements that were stated up above, like this, this talks about soil characteristics and that there needs to be borings done. Um, so some type of due diligence on a property to determine <laughs> for site planning. Um, and so it's already stated here, so it was kind of duplicated. Um, I did, these are not my edits. Um, so let's go through these. Cross sections of all wetlands showing slopes, banks, bottoms, and bottom treatments. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think cross sections are important for a wetland delineation. Um, the only exception I would say to that is um, for stream crossings. 
because for stream crossings, you really do need, um, I'm just gonna highlight this. You really do need the cross sections because in order to see that you're meeting the state stream crossing standards, like 1.2 times bankful, that the, that the design is um, uh, 1.2 times beyond where the bank is. And also that you're meeting the openness ratios that are required under state law. But for, for wetlands, I don't think that that's necessary. Existing and proposed water storage capacity of the property, including calculations and data on which the capacity is based. Uh, please, if you uh, guys- In reference, reference <laughs> to like flood risk for other adjacent properties, like it's holding capacity. So if you pave a wetland, that water is gonna go somewhere else. Is that what it means? I mean, it's not well worded, but I don't really important? know what it means. Okay. Um, I think it's it's a storm. What they're talking about there is stormwater calculations, which are required for, you know, they're required, like I said, for very specific things, not for single family homes. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, for a single family home construction, you're not putting some consideration to water, right? A lot of times you have um, roof, you have gutters that are installed for roofs and then you have downspouts and then the downspouts are directed toward a French drain or a foundation drain. Um, a lot of times those foundation drains will drain away from the house and then you'll have either catchment somewhere else or you'll have like a level spreader or you'll have like a little gravel outlet where the, where the, um, the uh, drainage is coming away from the home. There are stormwater considerations that are typically included with single family house plans, but it's not considered that you have to submit a stormwater management plan. And that's kind of what the, this language is getting at. I think, um, I mean, I guess I could go either way on that, but I do think that it would be very overkill for a, a single family home owner to have to calculate all precipitation that falls on a given property over the course of a 365 day period. <laughs> like, it just seems. Well, okay. So here's a story about um, a neighbor of a neighbor who, you know, built a house and changed their drainage. And all of a sudden the other neighbor has a flooded basement. Like, so is that, does this fall? And is, is the intent here trying to prevent maybe, you know, adjacent well, effects? I think what you're getting at, Michelle, and I think this is important to state somewhere in here, which is really smart, is um, <laughs> to their neighbor's <laughs> backyard. I mean, that, that does come up a lot. It really does. Absolutely. And I think it's a really important point but I think it's going in a different direction than what the other line was saying, no, which is not to say that this is not, you know, it's just worded differently, you know? That might be out of place. I mean, obviously that would have to be wordsmith, but yeah, I don't know. that The stuff that's crossed off is hard to follow. I'll certainly yeah. agree. And so I'm trying to understand what the intent of the author was. You just faded away on your volume, Michelle. I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. understand the intent of the original author and these sort of hard to follow points here. Location and the elevation of benchmark used for survey. I think that's probably an important one. Oh. Okay. Lots of storage on downstream channels and culverts if filling is proposed. I'm just going to remove this one. This is an interesting one here. Um, sorry, that one kind of got lost in the cross. Yeah, that was, was interesting. Does it is it included in the stormwater stuff? Like I kind of remember talking about it with the that UMass development, but mm -hmm. yeah. 
I, I'll, I'm going to keep this one in, but I'm just going to highlight it um, that we might need to put that in another location. But uh, yeah, I think that's it's pretty kind of relevant. Um, invert yeah. elevations on catch basins is also important. I don't, like I said, I didn't make all of these edits. A lot of these were made before me. So this is exactly why we're looking at this. Proposed on-site pollution control devices, absorption pillows, detention basins, vegetation lowers. Yeah, I mean, these are, th these are all stormwater best management practices that are described here. Um, I don't really think that belongs there. I mean, it's like, it's like a, it's a plan requirement that's required anyways. You have to include that. You have to include so much information on the stormwater management plan. Um, locations and details of erosion control devices and stormwater management features. Okay, so I think, I think this VIII covers the VII above because it says stormwater management features. So I'm, I am going to pull that one out if that's okay with you guys. Because I think VII covers it there now. But I'll, I'll wordsmith this a little bit now that we've talked about it and I know kind of where you guys stand with it. <sighs> site visit, site requirements prior to inspection. Stakes indicating the corners of proposed houses. Yes, absolutely. Stakes indicating the limit of proposed works. Yes, lot number or house number posted at the location. Not necessary. Um, boundaries of all resource areas clearly delineated and flagged. Yes. Minimal conditions. No real substantive changes there. All structures, facilities, equipment as part of the project shall be continually operated and maintained so as to so as to maintain compliance. That's not how you spell maintain. Okay. With the permits, just cleaning up the wording there a little bit, I think. So we have a whole section on violations, a whole, whole section um, in, in section three of the regs. So this is duplicate and not really necessary, number 10 there. Um, and there's a whole section on extension of permits as well. So I think that it's, it's duplicate and it doesn't really make sense here because this is conditions for, for submission requirements. And then this is section six, which is um, basically saying that the commission can hold a public hearing and revise these regulations at any time. So, wow, that was a really great timing. We made it through the entire section. Um, do you guys have anything else you want to add? Um, not in regards to this at this time. Okay. I was thinking at the next meeting, depending on where I'm at with section four, we might want to start looking at you guys' markups for sections one and two. I'm going to be finishing the revisions on section three and sending that document along for your markups as well. But um, that's kind of where things are. It's all I have for you today. And um, we'll be in touch. Okay. And if you do want to um, schedule a... Um, a two-hour session. I'm I'm open to that. I just would need to you know prepare in advance. So maybe uh, Leroy, is that even is it possible for you? Are you interested or? Um, that's very possible for me as long as we're going forward. So twelve to two instead. Right. I prefer that too. Okay. We we don't have to schedule it today. Um, let's not plan on that for the next meeting on the what is it going to be? Um, I have it in my book, so why don't we announce that now? So that the next meeting of the committee would be, the subcommittee would be on March 18th. That's the day that I have my appointment. So just in case I'm a little late, you guys aren't panicked, <laughs> but I, I, I'm hopeful that I won't be late. 
Um, but then maybe we'll, what we'll do is actually, and I think the timing of this would be really great is to have it be our meeting on April 1st. Okay. Should we because, plan for it then? I just need to make sure I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we plan for it? Let me just have a quick look because we're supposed to be doing the, let's make sure that I, um, yeah, we do have a meeting on April 1st. So we'll, we'll plan from, from noon to two um, on the April 1st bylaw review subcommittee meeting that we'll have a, a two hour meeting that day. And I'm hopeful that what we will be looking at that day is section four. Now, I'm not sure that I'm gonna go through every single change because I might rewrite that entire section, but what I will do is send you guys the documents far in advance and we'll kind of go through the spirit of what the changes are and my comments from town council and that sort of thing. All right, um, so hopefully we'll make that meeting. All right, thanks for all your hard work on this. It's looking. Yeah. Smooth. Yeah, it's, com it's coming along for sure. Okay, well, with that, we will close the meeting of the Wetland Bylaw Review Subcommittee at 1.03 <laughs> Eastern Time. Um, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Thank Next you. Week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Paul.